Syphilis, according to oh. the leading theory on its origin and history, came to is that that guy's wait is that that guy's name? Uh, no, actually, but um, but the name Syphilis, Syphilis Smith. The name Syphilis did come from someone's name. Uh, his his name I think was Jack. I I don't know. I don't have the story on this guy. Uh, came to Europe in the fifteenth century. Put my old friend Jack up there. Um, an unwanted and unknown passenger in Christopher Columbus's crew during their journey back from the Americas in 1493. In any case, uh, the first written records of an outbreak of syphilis in Europe occurred in 1494 or 1495, we're not quite sure, in Naples. Uh, it was prevalent then amongst a group of French troops um, who who were there for the French-Italian War of 1494 to 1498. So I guess it was 1494. A great war. I love that war. That's one of my favourites of the uh, middle uh, <laughs> middle um, teen centuries. Well, they, they didn't know they were in the War of 1494 to 1498 yet because they were still in they it. They didn't know they were at war? No, they knew it was a war. They knew it was a war, but I think war was much well, more jolly back then. Anyway, <laughs> since, since it was claimed to have been spread by French troops, it was initially called the French disease by the people of Naples, uh, but in 1530, the name Syphilis, uh, not that guy's name, uh, was created by um, an Italian physician poet, which I love the, the concept of, uh, both doctor and poet. No way. Physician poet. That's exactly what I was going to claim I've become. That's ruined my intro. <laughs> Girolamo Fracastro as the title of a poem. And the poem, it's in Latin, so I, I can't do justice to it. Go on. I've only got, Go I've on. only got the title. It's Syphilis Sive di Morbo Gallico, describing the ravages of syphilis the throughout French. Italy. Anyway. But the Gallico is French, yeah? That's referring to the French in the title. Uh, I, maybe. And morbo. Morbo means good, doesn't it? Four years of Latin. <laughs> anyway, throughout the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries uh, and the 19th century, syphilis was one of the largest public health burdens in prevalence, symptoms and disability in Europe even though we don't have a full picture of its prevalence because people are a little bit quiet about it because it was a sexually transmitted disease. Its damage was caused not so much by the great sickness um, or death early in the course of disease. In fact, it often took uh, a few decades to kill people, but rather by the gruesome effects um, that would emerge after 15 years or so of having the disease. Look, I'm going to stop you there. I'm no medical expert. But what you're showing me there, that's not a photo. Okay. It's it's a death mask made of wax of a guy that uh, later <sighs> died of syphilis as it had progressed to neurosyphilis, where the syphilis had got into the brain and he gets these things, the tabes dorsalis. Th this stage, it's characterized by the formation of chronic gummers, these, these big blobs. Gum on, gummers. These big blobs on his face are gummers. They're soft, tumor-like balls of inflammation, which... <sighs> Uh, typically affect the skin, bone and liver, but they can occur anyway. People listening at home without the imagery, first, go and look at the imagery, but second, good fucking God, that looks bad. Like, you would hope you'd go insane with that at the same time, because if you had to be sane and look like that, that would be ungood. In fact, this is one of the reasons why syphilis was such a, such a huge burden to, well, a uh, huge problem in Europe. It killed very slowly, and yes, it killed a lot of people, but actually some of the big problem was the, the hideous disfigurement. It was, a, it was a disease of disfigurement. But as well as that, as well as that, as well as disfigurement, it also gave a blessing of neurological damage. Uh, oh. People at this stage, and maybe even earlier... Uh, would suffer through dementia, personality changes, delusions, seizures, psychosis, depression. That's kind. Anyway. Even how you look, that's kind. Anyway, it, it, for a long time, people knew that it was sexually transmitted because it, had, it was the French disease. We knew it came from something like that. But for so many centuries, for all these four or five centuries where it was ravaging Europe, uh, it was the causes of syphilis were unknown. But, but, in 1905... The dermatologist Eric Hoffman and the zoologist Fritz Schauden, working at the charity clinic in Berlin, removed a tiny spiral-shaped bacterium from a papula in the vulva of a patient with secondary syphilis. They described this as treponem wait, wait, palladium. Wait, 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 um, yeah? I don't want to ruin the surprise, but zoologist and dermatologist? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was happy with that combination. I... I <laughs> I'm going to run with, um, I do not know from what kind of species these vulva were, <laughs> but I can wait. Uh, the zoologist was working working on human, was working on, I, I'm not sure why. It seems, As they do. It yeah, seems one of those common, scientific yeah. partnerships where you've just got a mate and you helped out in the lab. <laughs> yeah, The dermatologist, I understand. You know, you're looking at skin conditions. Sure. I, I have no idea. I did look into that, but I couldn't find it. 
anyway 1905 maybe the way they treated uh, matters to do with ladies was a little bit more remote and unusual um, maybe they couldn't quite cope I'm, I'm leaving that one for the moment <laughs> i'll leave <laughs> i'm reflecting on history here this is about history Anyway, uh, they described this as Treponym palladium. Uh, they dis this discovery allowed the development soon after of the first tre effective treatment for syphilis. And so in 1909, Sahachiro Hate uh, developed Arsifinema. <laughs> Sorry, some, some sort of medical name. A uh, uh, thing. Where finally syphilis had a cure. But, but something else was born in that moment. An idea. <laughs> Welcome to the Wholesome Show, the popular on the face of science podcast for people who sit up the back of the classroom. I've been describing it that way to people for a long time now. I'm glad you finally owned it. <laughs> Um, and in which we ask the uh, dumb and often quite offensive questions so that you don't have to, dear listener. The Wholesome Show is me, Will Grant, and... Me, Dr. Roderick Griffin Lambert's former poet slash... Uh, what, what was the other bit? Physician? Poet physician. Poet and we are physician. joined today by... Dr. Madeline Hingwood. Welcome. Um, yes, Madeline. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a research academic at the University of Newcastle. Welcome to the show, Madeline. We're going to be exploring some issues today. So The Wholesome Show is brought to you by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. And syphilis. Uh, is that in the centre title? Because the boss it's might gonna be. It's going to be. People are being forced to reinvent themselves in these troubled times. And if we really want to get noticed, maybe we should become aware of syphilis too. This is not actually, sorry no. to disappoint, Rod, a story about syphilis. This is I'm a, leaving. This no, is, I'm out of here. This is a story about an idea. It's about an idea that uh, has twists and turns, has some interesting things happen, has some results, and might crop up again recently. So, oh Why? No. How? I don't understand how anything that has an idea or a disease related to it could have anything to do with what's going on now, particularly given every episode you're in charge of. No, 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 no. This is, this is actually not. This is actually not. This is not anything really at all to do with COVID crisis. I know I'm addicted, to, I'm addicted to COVID normally, but this one, this one is not. This one is not. What I wanted to do first is a little bit more ghost hospital. Yes. Ghost hospital here. This is the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum at Trenton. Yes. It was. And that's uh, a photo from yesterday. Uh, no, it's probably not. It's one of those old coloured photos where, they, where you took a photo and then they had to colour it in with pencil afterwards. You get the kids and you say, hurry up, kids. Can you colour in all my photos? Uh, Isn't that called Instagram now? Uh, <laughs> I think so. So anyway, uh, Trenton, uh, as it's popularly known, or the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum, as it was then known, was founded in the 19th century by the activist Dorothea Lind Dix. She's a goodie. She did, she... Dorothea Limp what? Lind Dix. You know I heard Limp Dick, right? I, I got another one for you. I got another one for you in a little bit. Madeline, it's not too late for you to leave if you want to. This is only <laughs> going to get worse. Well, fabulous. <laughs> I, I do have one coming up that anyway. So Madeline Limpdick did what? <laughs> no, no, Dorothea. Dorothea. Oh, Dorothea. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, you're Madeline. I get so I know we're not up to me yet. Yeah. I see the name that I'm reading and I just, that's it, it pops into my head. So, no, Dorothea was a goodie. We're not going to hear much more about uh, Dorothea, yeah. sadly, but she went around America uh, looking in all sorts of different places to see how poorly people were, uh, the mentally ill were treated, and uh, she wanted to do something about it, and she campaigned in lots of different places to yeah. build better places to house the mentally ill. Yes, they may not have all ended up perfect, but her intentions were very good. Anyway. Hard, hard to make it worse. Uh, yeah, it, Very hard to make it worse. They found a way. Did you, did you, oh, want, cool. did you want to hear that? Did you want to hear they yeah. found a way? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Trenton was founded in 1848. And um, well, but by the early 20th century, it had, uh, the it had fallen into a little bit of disrepair. And so the asylum's first superintendent, Dr. Horace A. Butthole. No. <laughs> It's Buffalo, Boothel. <laughs> it might be. I don't know. It, it, Pronou uh, spell it. Can you spell it for me? B-U-T-T-O-L-P-H. -T -T so. Boothel. Boothel. Anyway, 
He had. Uh, sorry, Madeline. Sorry, sorry. This, this so will become sorry. this will become grown up soon. Don't worry. It'll be. No, wait. We we just got to get it out of our system, and then it'll still be there. Actually, that's but that's great. So we got Doctor Boothorp. So you got Lind Dix and Botolf. Um. Anyway, standards standards, standards standards had slid. So the asylum was described by people who were looking at it at the time as dominated by a subculture of violence and brutality, barely different to a prison. Uh, far from being working on the latest principles of psychi- uh, psychiatry, uh, the asylum was chock full of restraining apparatus and strong rooms, and inmates were treated brutally. Now that what year ma- were we talking? So this is 1907. So that may have been, you know, I, I don't doubt that brutality uh, yeah. occurred in, in asylums after then and before then, and definitely, I hate to say it, um, in this story after then. Uh, but they did look at this, and there were people looking at this of a modern bent saying, hang on, we can do better than this. We can do, we can do better than this. In fact, someone's yes. going to come in with a modern bent. And so in 1907, uh, some modern thinking came in to clean up the place. That modern thinking came in the form of the guy in the top right, standing with a sort of muscular uh, pose there in an ice hockey uniform, Dr. Henry Cotton. Uh, here's a photo Henry of Cotton. Henry Cotton. Henry Cotton. I thought he was. He was the commentator in Dodgeball, wasn't he? I don't know that. There he I is. There he is, looking a little bit older. Uh, Canadian? Uh, no. Uh, well, from Maryland. He played. He played ice hockey in in Maryland. So I don't know if that's a, a for him. common thing. Um, so, uh, Doctor Cotton was a product of establishment psychiatry. Uh, he trained at the University of Maryland, um, yeah. and then at the Jobs, Johns Johns Hopkins. Um, under Dr. Adolf Meyer, who was like the dominant figure in psychiatry in America at the time. Then he went to mm-hmm. Europe and he went and he trained even further under some of the leading psychiatrists at the time. Madeline, can you tell me if these are goodies or baddies? Um, uh, Adolf Meyer and then Emil Krapelin and Alois um, Alzheimer. Alzheimer. He probably discovered Alzheimer's. Maybe. I don't know. Don't, don't quote me on that. He sounds like the guy who... No, no. He was named after it. Maybe. It could be one of the two. Are they goodies yeah. or baddies? Well, I'm not sure. I think, I mean, they're, yeah, it's, I don't know. It's hard to know. They all do that. You know, they all like to name different things after themselves, don't they? And so they're all, um, you know, all those names are still used in certain diseases today, but it's hard to tell because without sort of being there, what did you find out? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, sorry. I, I got an ancient psych degree now, but crepe, crepe on it. Yeah. That, that name's that very familiar. familiar. Uh, he didn't. In, he didn't discover Alzheimer's. That's what I can. I can prove from here. That's what he didn't do. <laughs> no, he's uh, something to do with toiletry behavior. And if you're having a really bad crapolin, I don't no. know. I, I just I remember him from psych days in the late, early mid '80s. I can't remember what he did. Hm, familiar. Anyway, doesn't matter. Does, it, it really. It, it it may matter. It matters to him and it matters to his family. Uh, but he doesn't show up in this story again. Oh, so why would you tease me? Okay. 1907, uh, Henry Cotton, um, at the age of 30, won the job of medical director at the U- Lunatic Asylum at Trenton. Now, he this is straight after he'd been doing his postdoc equivalents in Europe. Um, and so he, he... Straight to director. He's straight to director. He shipped back He shipped back to New Jersey to become the medical director of this um, asylum that was in a bad place. But he was fo- fired by a modernist, reforming zeal. And so within two months of arriving, he'd torn down much of the old practices. So hundreds of the medic, uh, mechanical restraints through which um, all of the uh, participants, inmates, uh, participants are they are they participants? They're definitely participating. Uh, <laughs> Participant does not imply consent. It just means they were part of it. What, what do we call people back then, uh, Madeline? What, what were they called in a in a? I think, uh, I think they probably would have called them inmates, but it's inmate. not. I mean, that's probably not the nicest term. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's use their language and call them yeah. um, the inmates of the lunatic asylum, uh, asylumies. Uh, anyway, um, residents, yeah. residents of the asylum. Yeah. How about that? So, the hundreds of mechanical restraints were removed and relegated to the hospital's museum. Um, the strong rooms were torn down. He'd also he also installed installed fire alarms, which was um, well, 
Oh, burning down is not a great thing. So that's cool. Uh, he did something good there. Um, and he'd also con- commenced efforts to retrain and discipline all the attendants and expanded a pro- program to train all of the psychiatric nurses. So he wanted to he wanted to improve um, how the people working there were thinking about the patients that they're working with. He introduced... Now, all these young people with their fancy European ideas, they pop over, they think they know how to solve everything. Yeah, yeah, Never going to work. <laughs> well, he I mean, you can't and- do psychiatry without a strong room. You just can't. <laughs> I, I think we don't anymore. I think we don't. I I, well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. This, Is that your field, Madeline? I, I haven't been told. Um, do you know a lot about this? Oh, uh, yeah. Not. We're not quite there yet. Okay. Uh, so Vince is killing. Um, he yeah. So he introduced occupational therapy, and as as a lot of people have said, you know, Cotton in this period, well, actually throughout his whole career, he was he had somewhat of a humanitarian concern. He wanted to improve the lot of the insane residents of the hospital. Um, he was modern and caring in his approach, determined to remake the old asylum into a modern hospital, uh, Mm. utilizing resources of contemporary physical medicine. And he also read the news because the discovery of the bacterial cause of syphilis just two years earlier had put a rocket Mm. under the psychiatric world and cotton in particular. So the idea blossomed um, in Cotton, and there were a few other people that, that, um, that travelled with Cotton in this idea, uh, mm. that insanity could be transmitted by bacteria, or germs, as they talked about at the time. Are you going to say it could be transmitted sexually? Uh, well, they, they did think that, um, but they thought in general that, like we could transmit bacteria, that insanity could be passed um, between people. And it was, in a sense, they did think of it, in a sense, as a bacteria or a pathogen. So... The, the ways that this would happen is there's a thing called a, a focal infection or a focal sepsis. So this idea has been around for, for ages, um, mm. but, it, but it held that you could see a slight infection somewhere on the body, um, like syphilis. You might see, um, you might see uh, a scab or a, or a gummer or something like that. And then that was indicative of systemic disorders, something else going wrong, potentially going wrong in the brain. So what that what they were thinking then in in this period at the beginning of the twentieth century is that um, some sort of inf- infection could be causing um, any sort of mental ill health. So <laughs> uh, a lot of a lot of the ideas at the time then sort of started latching on the idea that a dental infection, um, you know, a rotten tooth or something like that, could be one of the causes of um, of mental ill health. So, so they did the classic thing where they went, oh, there's this one situation where this happened. It must be bloody everywhere. Uh, look, look, uh, maybe, maybe. Um, Not so, uncommon. So we heard it could be caused by infection. That must mean it's all caused by infection all and com- all infection causes it. <laughs> look, it was a theory. It was a theory to run with and you need a theory <laughs> and then you start experimenting. We'll come to we'll come to the experiments in oh, a second. Oh, good, good, because they're going to be great. So yeah, there was people in in the UK. So Henry Maudsley um, was saying that there was a connection between morbid poisons and delirium, or or the the British surgeon William Hunter was saying that intestinal stasis, which I think is the term for constipation, um, <laughs> was likely to cause um, mental instability or like mental stability. Um, there was a, they also um, leveraged off the idea that when people go into a fever from an actual a, a disease, like a bacterial disease, like a flu or something like that, um, yep. that because they turn um, delusional, they might hallucinate, things like that, that there's got to be some sort of connection between, uh, between fevers, bacteria, and uh, mental ill health. Sure, I'm convinced. <laughs> Solved. So, so a lot of people were theorizing here, um, but of course, Cotton was a man of action. He didn't want to just theorize about what was happening here. He wanted to see what was going on and, and take action. I have a really good feeling about the direction this might go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, ethically, ethically in particular, I'm feeling really good about this. So this is a picture from uh, Cotton's um, most famous book um, where it started with the teeth. So this is a zoomed in picture of the mouth of an inpatient at Trenton where they have removed, um, oh, I think about half of his teeth. So to sim- help him, to help him, to help him. Okay. So a campaign began at Trenton 
Uh, Conton started cleaning up the the infections in of chronic sepsis if, of the mentally ill at Trenton. Now, this isn't a bad idea. You know, no. it's probably a good thing to do to get rid of um, infected teeth and, um, and see if that'll it'll probably help anyway. It'll probably help anyway. So he employed a whole bunch of uh, bacteriologists and an armada of surgeons to start pulling out teeth. From all armada, of, huh? Is that your word? Uh, no, that's someone else's word. I, I don't, so how, how many is in an armada of surgeons? When does a group of surgeons become an armada? Like a oh, hundred? Three. No, three. Like, three? Like, because they're very, they're very big, grand people. So you get. So th- the Spanish armada had three ships. Or three surgeons. No, ships are smaller than surgeons. Ships, ships, oh, that's true. That's ships true. are wussy. Surgeons are grand. And so you get three surgeons yeah. in a room, you have an armada. Ships aren't even qualified. <laughs> All they got to do is sit there and float. I mean, how hard is that? So an armada of surgeons, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing like at, to the horizon, surgeons to the horizon. Maybe it was, maybe it was. Ish. I don't think it was as many as that. Um, but in the first 12 months, they had they had pulled out 4,300 teeth from uh, the people, the, the patients at Trenton. Now, the key thing here is that while they started wow. on the rotten teeth, um, then uh, cotton thought, well, you know what we could do? We could probably- Why stop there? Why stop there? Why stop there indeed? We could be a little bit proactive here. If teeth are going to be the cause of this problem, (sighs) uh, then we should start pulling out um, teeth proactively. So, and look, if you're going to go with that, the principle of the teeth being part of the problem, like, so pull out all the teeth and you're like, where do teeth come from? Like come out of the jaw. Maybe we should remove their jaws. What are jaws attached to? Heads. You're Maybe a th- scrape away. Like I'm an ideas man. I get you're, that. you're a thinker, and you, 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 look. Uh, you got to love a sense that starts with while they started with removing the rotten teeth. <laughs> um, look, we will uh. come to some other things. Yeah, well, look. Okay, they started on rotten. It was the point that I said, and then they went to normal teeth. So, for example, Good. Um, uh, Cotton had all of his um, own son's teeth removed when his son was 13 and exhibiting changes in disposition. Oh, my God. Keith, you're being annoying. I'm going to kick your teeth out. It's good for all of us. I'm just making sure you don't end up in an asylum. His wife as well, um, as a precaution. Oh, fuck me. (laughs) Jesus Christ. No, honey. It's for our relationship. I... I, uh, so these, so it's a big shift here from removing actually, um, infected teeth, rotten teeth. I can understand to something. Well, you should do it anyway. You should do it anyway. You're acting a bit weird. I'm going to have all your teeth removed. Did, um, just going out on a limb here. I'm guessing none of his teeth went anywhere. Yeah. I was going to ask that. I I didn't actually find that. I, 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 all he, his face looks actually, he he does look, no, he looks quite gummy actually to me. I, I, you know, That's a sign of a true believer, isn't it? It is. It's exactly that. If he'd said, you know what, just in case I get a bit weird, I want all these choppers gone. It's pretty close to a true true believer to do it on on your family, though. Or just an awful, awful, awful person. Probably a bit of both. Yeah, also what an early 20th century guy with power and and qualifications equals par for the course, surely. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know if he removed his teeth. I'll investigate later. I'm going to go, I'm going to guess. I'm, I'm going to bet some money. I'm going to bet your next year's salary, William. No. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, initial results. Who wants to guess? All good. All good. Madeline, you want to guess? No, no more crazy people. Uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, there's a potential that he got some results. I don't know. What happened? <laughs> yes, they ve- <laughs> they varied. <laughs> yes. So um, This is great. He did something. <laughs> did he get results? Yes. <laughs> so Definitely got results. I'll, I'll, we'll explore some more about his results in a little bit, but the initial results said that uh, some of them, he's saying you feel fully cured. So um, off they go. Cool. Others... These are the people who are in, whose insanity manifested as biting others, right? Uh, no, it didn't. So it's it was, a pretty safe call. It was just general insanity. It was, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how categorical they were on insanity back then. I'm sure they had different yeah, types. Um, not a lot. Depression, anxiety. I don't think they're as, as nuanced no. as that. No, those are as sensitive insurance categories. We're, we're talking more crazy, super crazy, angry crazy, <laughs> talk to yourself crazy. <laughs> this one's got not the now, not now. This one's got the painting crazy. This one's got the... Yeah, I, yeah. I don't, um, yeah, yeah, playing with blood, crazy. This one I can think, smell think, numbers, something like that. Who can't? Yeah. Uh, we will actually come to those categories later. Uh, so anyway, um, so while he claimed that some people were treated fully successfully, others not so much. But 
But Cotton wasn't someone that just gave up. So if a tooth extraction failed, failed by meaning to make them uh, mentally healthy, uh, he'd move on. First of all, he'd move on to the tonsils and the sinuses. So they started carrying out a large number of tonsillectomies. <laughs> work at the mouth, so just go deeper. <laughs> just good. At least didn't go up. I mean, other people left that to them to go up, but the, wow, the doubling down. Yeah, the, the, well, I've done what happened. I took all his teeth out, still nuts, and uh, he tried going down the throat. Um, so tonsillectomies um, and sinuses um, were carried out as an additional treatment. Um, yeah. If a cure was not achieved after these procedures. Then he turned his eyes further south. So um, what, he, what he would do is he'd start um, doing um, laparotomies, which are um, opening up your lap, uh, basically. Uh, to That's how I understand it. I'm sure there's a, there's a, a technical Latin definition for a laparotomy. Yeah. Um, and start looking at organs and seeing which ones might be the problematic organs. So, Just go and have a poke around. Uh, yeah, he joined in forces with the Mayo Clinic at this point. Um, cool, so he'd go cool. in and have a poke around, but then he would take things out. So good. Uh, the list of organs that he did remove included testicles, ovaries, gallbladders, stomachs, spleens, cervixes, and a lot of colons. Stomachs. Stomachs. Like, you know, losing your balls, losing your uh, uterus, et cetera, et cetera. Like, we, we can live with that. yes. Yeah. I thought I'd just whip out your stomach. Don't worry, it'll be over soon. <sighs> yeah. Uh, well. You, you, don't, you don't live very well without one. I mean, I'm no lap biologist, but you don't live very well without a stomach. Well. To be fair, you wouldn't be crazy anymore. Well, okay, here's a, here's a story. An 18-year-old girl. Um, who he treated with agitated depression. Um, That's how he treated her? Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, she, she was described as having agitated depression. So uh, successively removed her upper and lower molars, um, then had a tonsillectomy, then had mm -hmm. sinus drainage, treatment mm -hmm. for an infected cervix. That doesn't sound bad, treatment for an infected cervix. You don't uh, drain the sinuses for that, though. that doesn't work out. Removal of intestinal adhesions, um, all without affecting any change in her psychiatric condition. But then he got rid of the remainder of her teeth and she was sent home cured. Oh, pronounced cured. I apologise. Uh, I apologise. Yep. And you're okay. done. And you're done. Out you go. You got the lot. You got no teeth. Got to be good. Colons were the big one. Um, so whilst there were a lot of teeth removed, colons were, it became a, 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 a bit of a focus. Um, he, he's... He thought that one of the um, any long-standing constipation um, should be treated as early as possible. Now what was that? Intestinal inertia. What was it called? Stability. Um, Stability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stable intestine. Um, but anyway, he, he he felt he felt very much that uh, long-standing constipation would lead directly to psychosis. So, um, well, how long have, how long have you gone? I'm sorry to do this to you, Madeline, but I have to ask, Will. How long have you gone without? having a bit of a poo-poo. Wow, wow. Uh, how did you feel psychologically? I Well, um, a couple of hours, I guess. A couple of hours. Uh, Liar, know. carry on. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of hours. I'm just trying to fudge it so you can't time me exactly to, to know. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I do. Have, you, have you, you never had a couple of days? Uh, what's the longest I've gone? Yeah, without. Oh, oh, oh I thought you meant since I last... <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, no, that's very, actually, thank you. That was very frank of you. That's not what I was asking for, but thank you for, you know, you're bearing yeah. your soul. <laughs> I really don't think it's been super long. Um, I don't know. I had a oh, friend no, I do who know. was out for five days and yep. they were very, very unhappy. I'm not going to ask you, Madeline, unless you want to volunteer, but like five days. No, no, long. I'm not talking about that on you. Uh, <laughs> no, it's fine. Just checking. I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to exclude you. That's all. That's I, I did. I Thank did. You. I'm sure I've told this story before. Um, when we were doing our um, uh, common introductory training in the army reserves and, and they give you the cheese that, that blocks you up forever. And I think, I think there was two or three days worth of uh, not going to the toilet. And a friend of mine said that, yeah, his dad was in Vietnam and he didn't do a poo the whole time he was in Vietnam. And I was like, what? No, he was no. For, he was there for two weeks, so it wasn't it wasn't the longest tour of duty around. But uh, two weeks without that is n see again. I can see that that would lead to so mental 
possibilities. So there you go. So Cotton very much believed that theory. He it's thought any, anyone yeah. that's not regular, uh, psychosis. So he thought that at least yeah. 40% of juvenile delinquents um, were, the reason for that was that um, fiber. They, they, yeah, well, not enough fiber or that they were stuck down there. He also he also said, of course, because this is the age, um, that any um, any boys with masturbation problems um, should have colons um, attended to. And the the problem being, they masturbated. I assume. Yes. Uh, yes. Th- yeah. Not just masturbation as the problem. So he uh, he boasted of operations on the colons of children as young as six and eight. Um, uh. In a paper delivered in 1922, Cotton reported to the American Psychiatric Association. He'd, report, he'd reported on 250 colon operations undertaken at Trenton. Uh, he maintained that the results were very encouraging. 25% of patients had recovered from their insanity. Mm, yeah. Specific kinds? Oh, I, don't, I don't know. Insanity. Insanity. It was the general insanity. It was it, In, Insanity colon general. Yes. Yeah. And, and in fact... Um, in that okay. era, people were begging to be treated. His results were some of the best in the country. Um, patients what? or the families of patients were begging to send their, um, well, um, their unwell loved ones to Trenton. Uh, those who couldn't were demanding that their doctors would copy the, the, um, the treatments that uh, Dr. Cotton was using. There's a New York Times article in 1922 where it, mm. it praises Dr. Cotton, um, where it says, under the brilliant leadership of medical director Dr. Henry Cotton, there is on foot the most searching, aggressive, and profound scientific investigation that has yet been made of the whole field of mental and nervous disorders. There is hope, high hope for the future. He went touring around the world. He went touring to um, Great Britain, Ireland, to Scotland, and Norway, and you received huge applause where people thought... All the countries. Uh, yeah, well, okay. That's some of the countries. <laughs> some of the countries. Uh, where people thought that he was he was the leading light, but um, I said twenty five percent were claimed to have been cured um, of his colon operations, but he also published some of the other results there. So twenty five percent had been r- recovered from their insanity, fifteen uh, yeah. percent improved but not recovered, thirty okay. percent unimproved, and thirty thirty percent had died. Yeah, that's not an improvement. No, well. No longer unwell. Um, later studies, later studies suggest that maybe as many as forty-five percent of the people um, that uh, were operated on in Trenton may have died. So, for example, amongst his mm. patients was Margaret Fisher, the daughter of a, um, a wealthy, uh, well famed Yale economist, Irving Fisher, um, and so they sent her when she was diagnosed as a schizophrenic, um, and. Um, she, Cotton attributed her condition to a marked retention of fecal matter in the colon with marked enlargement of the colon in this area, um, for which she was subject to a series of colonic surgeries. Um, uh. And she died in 1919 of a streptococcal infection after the surgeries. Uh, good old infections. No mm. problem. Uh, the danger of the surgeries, in fact, was known um, by the patients that were there. So while... Um, can, I, can I ask, so I'm guessing a lot of the people approving the surgeries weren't so much the patients as, uh, what's the quote unquote, loved ones? Uh, well, the loved ones may have been slightly involved, but probably a lot, of the, a lot of the approvals for the surgeries were just done by Dr. Cotton. I was like, you need this. Okay. Yeah. So they were, in fact, um, yeah. many of them resisted violently as they were forced into the operating theatre um, and dragged in there and, and held down have surgery that you die from. So. Mad- Madeline, I assume you started looking at the internet by now because this, this is horrifying. Is this oh, it's so weird? awful. All those lives, like just all those lives. I think um, when you hear about data like that, it's hard not to imagine all the individual people. Yeah. That are- Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think it's those, those stories where people are, you know, there's, there's the daughter of some social, and, and many of the, they may not even be actual mental ill health. You know, it might mm-hmm. be a social diagnosis where it's like, oh, you're having the sex too much. Uh, so let's, let's wait, drag you off wait, there. Wait, are you making wild, unfounded claims like mental health may be related to culture and social mores? Come on. I'm just, just, How dare you, sir? Just saying, just saying. How dare you, sir? Um, so uh, the stories did get back. So um, the story of Margaret Fisher and a few others did get back to the families. People are saying this is, this is terrible. Um, mm. So in the 1920s, 1925, it attracted the attention of the New York Times. 
and um, the New Jersey State Senate decided to launch an investigation where Dr. Phyllis Greenacre um, conducted an investigation of the hospital. She described the hospital itself as unwholesome, which... Yeah. Oh, what? I, 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 well, we can't talk about that. Uh, she described cotton as singularly peculiar, and she realised that the, <laughs> the appearance and behaviour of almost all of the psychotic patients was disturbing to her because their teeth had been removed, making it difficult for them to eat or speak. Uh, singularly peculiar was her formal uh, report? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so she she brought the some of the results of the surgeries and the statistics to the New, New Jersey State Senate, but all of Cotton's um, scientific fans, um, so most of the psych- psychiatric um, establishment, uh, mm. the New Jersey uh, Lower House um, and the hospital board um, and even the New York Times uh, got behind Dr. Cotton and said that he is, um, his treatment methodology was a leading light and that we should all just keep on going. So the report went nowhere. The only investigation into this um, went nowhere. The operations continued. Um, Spleenectomies, hysterectomies, um, removal of hemorrhoids, and patients continued to die. Removal of hemorrhoids. Yeah, that's another thing that they took off. They look like they they might cause a mental ill health. As far as things go, I can think of much less benign things to do. But also, I mean, look, it's easy to bag out people from history, as we often do, because people from the past are dumb. But, um, yeah. Compared to what, I suppose, is the question. You probably don't have this, but, you know, compared to what other people were doing. Yeah, absolutely. This might have been, might have been genius and brilliant and way better and blah, 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 blah. I'm just going to have, you know, a moment of being fair. I'll, I'll back okay, up. okay. I'll add to your moment of being fair. And, yeah, and yeah they didn't have, um, not that they couldn't have invented them, but modern statistical techniques to try and actually compare, you know, what are the results here? They didn't have, they didn't have any control group. They didn't have ways of ways of measuring people in, in different States. So, um, the data that they collected was really faulty from our standards and they weren't yeah. attempting to do that. So yeah. Um, That's it. We can get back to bagging them out now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, but bagging him out. I mean, he, he, he was undone eventually, but not by any of his, um, any of his surgeries. So eventually the great depression hit and, um, Dr. Cotton had been running a private hospital on the side where he did more of these surgeries for money. Um, oh, yeah. rather than the, the sort of ones that he's doing as the ward of a state. And, um, and then the Great Depression hit and everyone, there's a huge backlash against this sort of entrepreneurialism. So they re- removed him then. Um, but the hospital... Um, could so wait, wait, wait. The reason you're talking about this story is because we're about to go into the next Great Depression. This is your long way of getting back to the current COVID situation. Maybe. No, it's not. It's not. No, what I want to get back to, you, 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 you'll see where I get back to. Uh, no, it's not COVID. I told you, it's not COVID. It's not COVID. Yeah, but I, I, until I know for sure, I, I won't believe you. So they started reassessing um, all of his work in 1932 and they started to understand. Right. So um, they finally found out the true mortality rates from the surgery um, and little Ooh. evidence for any cures based on any of this. Um, so oh. Cotton, Cotton fought, fought back against all of this and, and um, argued in the psychiatric press that his, his work was legitimate. Uh, but he died suddenly of a heart attack in 1933. And to that day, most of the psychiatric establishment was still defending his methods. So in all, he'd m- removed 11,000 teeth and performed 645 major surgeries, killed hundreds of people, huh. killed hundreds of people. But uh, if he killed hundreds, that means he cured at least 70 or 80, right? Uh, it could. I don't know. Uh, According to the, uh, the methods of the time. It seems probably zero. Uh, actually <laughs> cured due to his methods. I mean, maybe okay. maybe it's possible. He was lauded uh, in the New York Times and the local press when he died for being mm. a pioneer seeking a better treatment path. Um, okay. And um, removal of patients' teeth um, was still the norm at Trenton Hospital or, or Asylum until 1960. So they <laughs> didn't even give up on that. I've got some pictures of the Trenton Hospital now. It's total ghost hospital. So oh. now... Another tourist attraction. In 2018, psychiatrist Oliger Plana Ripoll was wrestling with a puzzling fact about mental disorders. He knew that um, many individuals have multiple conditions. This comes back a little bit to how we start thinking about those people that were treated at Trenton or people now who have mental ill health. 
yeah. that uh, categorizing and understanding them is a really tough thing to do. So um, Planet Ripoll, um, he knew that many individuals have multiple conditions. So anxiety and depression, schizophrenia and bi- bipolar disorder. He wanted to know how common it was to have um, more than one diagnosis. So he got his hands on a database containing the medical details of around 5.9 million Danish citizens, which is... Um, wait, 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 wait. How many people in Denmark? Yes, there's five. I actually looked up and it said 5.86 million. So I don't, I don't know, someone's rounding here, but he got... So, the, <laughs> we're talking over time then. He, he, no, he got all of the people in Denmark. Um, no, what I mean is the, the database would have reflected some people living, some people yeah, not yeah, so Yeah, uh, well, yeah. Well, it's it's all of the currently alive people, I I, I believe. Um, so Denmark it, Denmark has interesting rules about the medical records and what you can do with them. Uh, no, but is there attitude to mental illness? You have one unless otherwise diagnosed? Because uh, that's what this is you, smelling like. You have a medical record. No, no, I'm talking about oh, oh, medical record. I thought you meant they were all... Um, no, 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 not, not everyone. People with psychiatric conditions. So here's the thing. So no. So he looked, at, he looked at everyone in Denmark, everyone in Denmark, to see what the overlap between um, different diagnoses was. And he was kind for of- For anything or for mental disorders? Mental disorders. Mental disorders here. Okay. Um, and the thing that he found was that every single mental disorder predisposed the patient to every other mental disorder, no matter how distinct the symptoms. Mm-hmm. Every single one. There's a, there's a nice little chart here. Uh mapping them all they all connect to each other so so that was basically a chalkboard with red bits of yarn yeah, it's red that. bits it's 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 like joining them together um we knew so that- wait madeline's here because she's an expert in danish mental health no she's not madeline, this is a madeline a specialization is a psychiatric epidemiologist and what i wanted oh, to cool. do i wanted to talk about this study i wanted to talk about this study with madeline so basically what they were saying is that we knew that comorbidity so so two conditions at the same time was important but we didn't expect to find associations for all pairs. And in fact, even uh, seemingly separate disorders. So for example, um, they were finding connections between autism and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which in the, in the diagnostic and statistical manual, I think that's illegal. You're not allowed to have the two at the same time. Is that true, Madeline? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, that's what that article said. Yeah, so it was great. Really interesting. So, so what does, do- it, does it matter that Will has both of those at the same time now? This isn't easy. <laughs> well, maybe he's allowed after this study was published. I, I am allowed now. See, it's not illegal. <laughs> I, so, so what, what does this mean? What does it, I mean, if, if all of these, if they're all connecting to each other, are the categories useful at all? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I think. I mean, for me, and I think that it was, um, this article was so good because it's something that um, I've been thinking for a while. I, I feel like we just don't know enough about the biology of the, un, you know, the underlying um, potential disorder for mental illness. And so by categorising just on clinical symptoms, there could be some very similar underlying biology that we're not picking up on. And um, I noticed that in the article, he was talking about how neurological disorders had no overlap with so they were quite distinct. And I think for a lot of those, it's because we have some idea about the brain biology um, that's associated with them. But for mental yeah. illnesses, we, we're we still not really sure. A lot of it's just guessing. To what extent do we disentangle those though, the mental illness versus the psychiatric? Or neurological disorder. disorder. Or neuro- yeah, sorry, yeah, the, the neurological versus mental. Well, I mean, at the moment, um, they're quite different and the symptoms are different and it depends on which neurological disorder you're talking about. Um, but I, I think, I feel like maybe in another hundred years, it would be really interesting to come back and see what we've learned <laughs> um, about the biology of mental illness. And some of them might end up being categorized as neurological disorders because we know exactly what's happening. But so like if, if you've got, um, you're going to have psych, uh, uh, mental disorders manifest, you know, like from brain dysfunctional brain disorder, Yep. Neurological, like objectively observable brain disorders, right? Yep. And you're going to manifest certain symptoms and categories of mental illness that will appear in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, the American Psychiatric Association version 5 or 5R now, I can't remember. Um, yep. So they're connected, like a, a neurological disorder can lead to mental manifest mental disorder manifestations, right? Yeah, some, yep, some of them definitely have um, yeah. symptoms. So uh, like people with multiple sclerosis sometimes can end up with... Um, memory or mood problems. So okay. we know, you know, a fair bit about the biology of multiple sclerosis and there's some really good 
treatments for modifying the outcomes of multiple sclerosis. Um, but because, you know, we don't know exactly what it is that causes the problems with mood that someone might experience. So, Do you- Oh, I was, uh, you know, one of the things I was reading here is that the the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual has just gotten fatter and fatter over the years as we've, you know, had a certain number of categories and then there's heaps and heaps and more subtypes um, within all of those things. Is that idea useful anymore or do we need to move to a different sort of system for understanding um, neurological disorders? No pressure. Um, yeah. Gosh, I know that's a big question. I'm not sure. I mean, epidemiology is the... You know, we look at it from a population level. So I'm not, I'm not a clinician. I don't sit in front of a patient and need to put them into one of those categories. So maybe for clinicians, it's getting more useful um, over time, having it big. I'm not sure, but that's definitely why we all need to work together on these things as well. So, so you work, um, you basically go, okay, these are the pre-existing and predefined categories. Okay, let's see how they're mapping out across populations. Well, no, I mean, I'm interested in I'm interested in risk factors um, for those yeah. things and trying to link um, what we might find out in an animal study mm-hmm. to zoologist. what's the corresponding risk factor in people. Sorry? I was just saying, there, you need a zoologist involved with the animal studies. So. <laughs> Maybe we need to go back to the, those collaborations from the 1920s. Well, as a physician poet myself, I can see the value in that. I think it makes sense. <laughs> so, so what then? What then are the sorts of risk factors that are the key interest now um, for um, people in psychiatric epidemiology? Right. Well, the one. So, I'm interested in a few different things, but one of one of the things um, I'm interested in is the uh, effect of stress because it's a major risk factor for a lot of um, mental disorders. So. Stress-related mm. disorders include things like anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress disorder, which I think in that article, the Nature article that um, you were discussing, um, that author had found had like a common base anyway. So there might be a, quite a lot of, that was interesting to read because I think there's quite a lot of overlap maybe in the biology of those stress-related disorders. Um, but yeah, also um, risk factors associated with different, um, the use of different pharmaceuticals um, mm. and things like that. So yeah, so epidemiology is just trying to measure. There's, um, and that, speaking of articles, there's another nice article um, which was published um, by an American professor in the American Journal of Epidemiology describing epidemiology as the quantitative part of public health, which is a, yep. like a really beautiful way to describe it because epidemiology is hard to describe sometimes. Mm. So it's sort of measuring at the population level um, like health, what causes health, both good health and poor health. Um, so that's, yeah, what I'm interested in doing for psychiatric and um, overlapping psychiatric and neurological disorders. Well, I'm a huge fan of this. My, my background, um, health psychology, medical anthropology, particularly looking at um, such phenomena. Yeah, well, my phenomena undergrad was psychology. Yeah, fascinating stuff. And, and I, it, it intrigues me, the categories, I mean, it, it, I, I talk about this with students, the classic thing with the, the diagnostic manual is, the fact that it can change over time, the fact that social mores can change the notion of what constitutes an illness. And the one that always is brought up is uh, homosexuality. Oh yeah. You know, early versions in the 1970s listed it as a disorder and then one variation to the next, one version to the next, it suddenly dropped away because yeah. people went, you're not fucking sick, dude. Yeah. Well, and I wonder the extent to which other stuff is going on like that behind the scenes. And you guys are relying on the categories that have been defined. I'm not, not having a go at your profession. I'm just saying yeah, but, you have no yeah, choice. True. Yeah. And that, that, that's going to put a curveball in there, surely. Yeah. Well, I guess I guess that's like the best that we've got at the moment is that mm. that, that manual. And um, yeah. Yeah. And I know what about the ICD? What is it? I see the, the, the World Health Organization. International, like, International Classification, Classification of Diseases. Of diseases. Yeah. So that's usually the one in those 11. big, hmm. yeah, in those big um, Scandinavian data sets, like the medic, you know, the, the countries that have good medical records that you can use for observational studies. Oh, you like yeah, they all, yeah, yeah. yeah, they all rely on ICD-10 diagnoses in there, okay. you know, to do that work. So it's true, but I guess, I don't know, I'm, yeah. I, so this I was, that, this was yeah. saying here that the, the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases, they'd move to maybe more of a, a sort of dimensional um, way of looking at, at symptoms rather than categories. Instead of, you know, these fixed, you have anxiety or depression or something like that, but moving to different ways of putting things on different dimensions? Um, I'm not sure. I haven't seen, like, I haven't seen that yet. So I have to have to look into it. But, um, yeah. It's got homework. 
<laughs> yeah, that <laughs> sounds interesting. You're welcome. I don't know. I mean, as far as I know, they still put them in categories yeah. on the on the, like with the hospital discharge form or something, and that's what you're looking at when you do get those records. Yep. So, are we all going to get PTSD from COVID? Oh, I know. I think everyone's stress levels are probably quite high. Mm. Told you I'd bring it back, Rod. We got stress. <laughs> got, yeah. Finally. But that's but fine. are we all going to be okay? Maybe we just need to play Tetris or something to stop it, or. Yeah, I'm not sure. And that's the thing. Yeah, um, we don't really know what is the answer for um, stress either. So some people seem to be prone to it more than others. Um, yeah. So, you know, putting if you put half a dozen people in the same situation, they won't all have. So the environment is exactly the same, but they don't all have the same stress response. So it's like our innate biological response to a stressful situation is different and it might predispose us differently to a disorder. So, Do you know the other thing that's going to come in is is – age when this hits and how that affects your developmental processes etc like so watching we wouldn't have to wait a while kids and teenagers and things like that yeah yeah yeah. who are getting this hit now like yeah. i'm my, you know late 20s therefore for me you know it could have a different effect to people who are you know five etc um i think that's going to be very interesting to see the extent to which that environment affects people across age ranges the environment we're in right now because yeah. I can imagine people who are older are going to be more more fucked up by it than people who are younger, for example, hypothesizing wildly. Well, maybe, but it's also, it's probably like they're also their individual risk as well. Like, mm. you know, some people are quite resilient to the effects of stress and maybe they pass that on to their kids. We don't know, you know, is it genetic or is it because they're modeling the behavior? Is there something that we should all do? I mean, if, 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 uh, yes, we, stay we, home. Yeah, that, that, but we as communities, are there things that, um, governments need to be doing or communities need to be doing to start thinking about the the stress and the anxiety and the the, the mental well, health issues that, yeah. that are coming in here? I think that I'd like, I've seen some people doing, starting up some um, great studies already trying to monitor the stress over time. But I suppose in the meantime, until we, um, we haven't like quantified all the effects and we don't know quite what to recommend for stress yet. We don't know, we don't know quite what the right intervention um, is for stress. Um uh, to try and prevent because it would be ideally you know we could talk about stress as a risk factor for some of these disorders from occurring and try and mm. come in at that preventive level like we do with physical illnesses and um, other risk factors for them like poor nutrition or physical activity um, so I guess raising the awareness is useful and um, uh, yeah making sure that if people are feeling like that then maybe there's somewhere they can go for help I, I got a completely related question did you know this whole episode was going to start with a whole bunch of talk about syphilis because you, you seen you, you kept the good deadpan there but i, I don't did will prime you properly I was, yeah i was a bit nervous about getting questions <laughs> something i don't really know much what's about. your knowledge about great. syphilis i'm not going to question great you. intro <laughs> yeah. that would have been a great throw over so madeline as a psychiatric epidemiologist tell us about syphilis like, <laughs> fuck off. thanks for that <laughs> Well, yeah. thank you very much, Madeline, for joining us in today. Um, and thank you very much, Pint of Science, for contributing, Madeline, to us um, oh. to help explore psychiatric epidemiology. And So well, they sacrificed the her to us. Bad, something like that. They, no one's allowed to drink in the pubs anymore. I think if you're in Darwin, you're still allowed to have Pint of Science um, now. No, you're, ex you're expected to drink in the pubs now because what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, well, something like that. Well, thank you. yeah, and I'm just sitting back for Wave 2. It's going to be great. <laughs> Don't be so pessimistic, man. No, I'm not pessimistic. Like all pessimists, I'm just a realist. <laughs> Will's little face. If you're not watching on the YouTubes, you should just to watch Will's little face fall. It's going to be fine. Leave my you? little head alone. Leave my little head alone. The Wholesome Show is me, Will Grant, and that guy, Rod Lamberts. We've been joined today by Madeline Hinwood from the University of Newcastle. The Wholesome Show is brought to you by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. Syphilis and syphilis. <laughs> See you next week, listener.